Well, welcome everyone. I'm really looking forward to this talk. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Barb Tatarnik and I'm the manager for continuing education and outreach here at Covey and I would like to welcome all of you to today's talk. Ron Jackson, to my right, is a Covey Fellow and the author of Wine Science, Wine Tasting, a Professional Handbook, and my favorite, Conserve Water, Drink Wine. <laughs> Ron has a BSc and an MSc from Queen's University and a PhD from the University of Toronto. He describes himself as having a split academic personality as a botanist and a microbiologist and started his work in the wine field by studying genetics of botrytis, which led him to his interest in wine production and wine tastings. His enthusiasm is infectious, and I know many of us have really been looking forward to his talk today. And today, Ron will be speaking to us about wine language and giving us valuable insights into the mind of the taster. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ronald Jackson. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, well, hopefully uh, that isn't worthwhile, but uh, certainly wine language is, uh, language in general is totally fascinating, it's, because it covers so many things, and since it's how we communicate, uh, it is actually a window into our mind, and so the, the language we use actually tells us a great deal about us, uh, sometimes uh, a lot more about us than it does about the wine. But, uh, so, uh, well, one of my favorite authors is Mark Twain, and he was very uh, skilled in his use of language and was very terse and had some nice punch lines. And I, I really love the one about the essence of teaching. And uh, he said, the essence of teaching is you tell them what you're going to tell them. And then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> and uh, that, that, that really is basically the essence of teaching. And so, so to follow his motto, uh, here's I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, in summary, <laughs> so uh, language as you probably well know, if you actually think about it, uh, has a body version, Mwah! and uh, then we have the, uh, the non-verbal uh, grunts and all those nice things, and then we have the, the verbal vor version, which certainly is the far more informative form. Then we have all this function, of course, it has immense number of functions, more than uh, one initially thinks of, uh, and certainly when I started to think about it, gee, which uh, language has many more functions than one normally actually thinks. Well, certainly we think of communication and uh, trying to concentrate into essentially icons, uh, a modern term, and of course we call those icons words. And uh, so we uh, can express our thoughts, uh, concepts, uh, there are various properties thereof. Uh, the use of term certainly will indicate our emotional response to that particular topic, and certainly what language we will use will depend on the situation in which one is positioned. Then we have its specific application to wine. Okay, uh, what have we got? Well, we've uh, if we're going to describe it, we'll talk about its appearance, its taste, its mouth, feel, olfactory characteristics. So I'll talk a bit about that. Then we have the uniqueness of olfaction. It really is kind of a unique sense. And uh, so I'll briefly say a few words about the chemical nature of what we can smell, uh, then the genetic basis well, what's the genetics of our ability to smell? And then the neuronal response. How do we interpret this? Uh, the sensations that go to our brain. And then the problems with identification based on how we develop our memory. And uh, then we'll skip on to uh, 
categorization of odor terminology. And there, there we have uh, aspects which relate to time uh, and how we receive, receive these sensations over a period of time. Uh, and then we have the intensity of these sensations. And then we have the quality of that sensation. And this can be described either in holistic terms or we can try and be very precise. And of course, as uh, everybody here is well aware, uh, people who are going to become tasters or are going to be enologists uh, take language training. And uh, of course, you have to prepare samples. That, that, that's a bit of a nuisance. And uh, you have uh, if you're going to be on a tasting panel, then you are trained in a particular manner. Uh, if you're going to be a, a winemaker, then probably it's going to be slightly different than that for a panel member. If you're going to be in the wine trade, it'll be different again. If you're going to give wine appreciation courses, then again, it will be different again. So what you train people for is going to depend on what function you're going to use them for or what they are going to use it for. Uh, then we have various influences that bias what we actually perceive because we do not perceive reality. Uh, we never do. We can't. Uh, it, it's actually our senses go to the brain and then the brain interprets this based on past experience. And so based on your past experience, depends on what you perceive. Uh, uh, what the eye gets, of course, we see three-dimensional world, but what the eye actually would uh, get as an impulse is on a curved surface. It's on this curved surface, the back by eye. Well, obviously we don't see the world in that manner. It's that we learn how to interpret this distorted image and then create it into one that fits the world that we come to experience from a child upwards. So, uh, uh, depending on the instructions one is given in a tasting, you will see different things. Uh, everybody knows this. Uh, environmental disturbances certainly can influence what you perceive, uh, or at least what you think you perceive anyways. And then we have how effective is wine tasting anyways. Uh, not that good. Uh, uh, then what would one like the thing to be in a real ideal world? Well, we don't live in the ideal world, but uh, it, one can always contemplate what would things uh, like to be. And then we take uh, the, the take home story. So uh, that's basically uh, where I'm flowing since this is a conceptual kind of talk, uh, I thought it might be useful to at least know uh, the route I'm going to follow. Oh, oh yeah, that's that, right. Okay, language. Well, we have the, the body part, the, the smiles and the frowns and all that sort of thing. Uh, useful and basically uh, it is the motive, just like the nonverbal form of language, uh, where we uh, say wow or mmm and all those sorts of things. It is a form of language, but certainly not very verbal. And then we have the verbal form, the one I'll be talking about primarily, uh, which is the precise communication form, uh, where we use these icons called words to express uh, various uh, aspects of the real world, be it an object, wine, or a concept, the quality of the wine, well that's a concept, it's not a real thing, it's uh, certainly a concept, uh, we express opinion, uh, I think the wine is great, well that, that's an opinion, uh, then we have the properties of these uh, essences, uh, we have the aspect of time, uh, does it change over time, uh, we, have, we, we have words that indicate location, words for color, Words for gender, possession, uh, motion. And then we have the yet other type of uh, motion called emotion. Uh, the uh, 
modern version, email, emotion, yeah, yeah there, there we are. And uh, we have uh, entertainment functions, certainly when you uh, read articles in newspapers and wine journals, other than the technical ones, uh, certainly entertainment is a major component of that aspect. And then the subliminal emotional content of the words and the situational influence as how that influences features. So subliminal emotional content. Uh, most of us know this uh, and in fact I, I didn't even realize it for, for a long long time until one of the profs at BU was talking to me about all these emotional hidden meanings in words. And, uh, really? And she would, yeah, in fact, uh, we do have lots of this hidden away in there. And uh, if I say a wine is tart, well, that has kind of a positive essence to it. It's not negative. But if I say it's sharp, most people say, mm, I, don't, I don't like it so much. And uh, so the, it refers to the same thing, the acidity, but the specific word I use will give a connotation of how I am responding to that sensation. Uh, if I say the wine is weak, that's kind of negative. Now, if it's also weak, but I want to give a positive twist to it, I'll say a delicate, or it has finesse. Ooh, yes, indeed. Uh, same thing, but it's... Uh, it certainly is going to indicate what my mind is saying emotionally with the same sensation. Uh, austere. Oh, yes, indeed. High class wine, this one. Uh, my, my friend that I know, a friend who will, uh, is always talking about these austere Bordeaux's. Uh, well, I try them, I say they're damn hard. Uh, because, of course, I'm not particularly. Uh, great lover of Bordeaux uh, since, uh, unless they're old. If they're old, okay, yeah, they're pretty good. Uh, young one, oh God, I just find them hard. But uh, I have a friend who likes that, that aspect, and so he uses the term austere. And uh, often he'll say, oh, the, this wine has subtle aroma. Well, uh, to me it's just all illusionary imagination now that he's perceiving, uh, I say there's nothing there. Uh, but uh, <laughs> again, th th this is how we are responding to the wine. Same thing, just you put in emotional content. And uh, if I say it's jammy, oh, wow, hey, that, that's got real guts. Uh, that's obviously good. Now, just fruity, well, well not too bad, but. Uh, not, not, not so great, and not, unless you're talking about a white wine, in which case, now fruity is good, uh, but with a red wine, you don't want a fruity, oh, oh that, that's kind of wimpy, uh, so you can't have that. So, uh, it, it's kind of fascinating the words people use re really tell you a lot about the person and how they're responding. Uh, then we have this entertainment aspect, oh yeah, that, that's great stuff. And, you read the article about, oh, he got off the plane and it was a wonderful trip and it was a lovely sunny day in Tuscany and the guy drove up in his red um, Ferrari and we zipped off up the mountainside to his winery and oh yeah. What's it got to do with the wine? Absolutely nothing. Uh, but here, uh, and is it telling you anything? Not very much other than the fact he had a damn good time. <laughs> so, so entertainment and then we have hyperbole oh well they use that a lot in this popular literature uh, all the wine contained hints of truffle ooh yes oh that sounds good and some sweet jasmine and some black cherry pits oh yeah <laughs> great pits uh, and then, then we have apple core well is it young or old uh, and then we have hints of barnyard well uh I know a wine that is uh, famous for hints of barnyard, and I, I think it's disgusting, but he just had dirty barrels, that's all. Uh, and then earthy and saddle, oh yeah, well, they, they just fluff. 
What's it tell you about the wine? Basically, it tells you absolutely nothing uh, other than it is emotive and takes up pages. And uh, since the, the writer gets paid by how many words, the more uh, that this fluffy puts in, of course, he, he fills his uh, word limit. Then we have alliteration. And uh, here's a quote from someone I happen to know quite well. Okay. For many producers, as well as aficionados, uh, wine is an art object, albeit a liquid one. Uh, all that attention to detail, striving for individuality, oh yes, 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 uh, retention of attributes of sun, soil, and scion, uh, culminate <laughs> in the moment it is poured into the glass, swirled, sipped, savored and swallowed, then it fades into memory. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that, that would damn flood writing, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, uh, oh, okay, it, it sounds great, uh, and, uh, it, but does it say very much? Not really, but sounds good. And uh, often, uh, when you're writing, uh, that's what you want to do, is uh, you want something to sound good. And uh, I always like alliterations. Uh, I remember when I was a student and trying to analyze these poems, and said, well, it's got five alliterations, three similes. To <laughs> that, that. Uh, I rated poetry basically on uh, the, this mathematical procedure. Uh, I've never been able to really understand poetry, but anyway. And then we have other attributes that we employ in language and often applied to wine, especially in wine societies. Uh, if you have somebody who really thinks they know what they're talking about, uh, then they will try to express this in, in emotive terms and try and sway opinion. Of course, we know that really well with politicians. And then if you're really dominant, uh, then you become a good demagogue w with the use of language. And situational influence. Uh, how is that going to influence the language one might use? Uh, certainly that's going to change things. Uh, if I'm thinking of a particular style, and most of you, if you're thinking of a particular style, you have your own ideal type of what could be a sherry. And so automatically you switch and you start to use particular words for sherries that you wouldn't use for anything else. And if it's a Beaujolais, well then, then you change the type of terminology you're going to use. If it's an Amarone, and then you're going to change the gifts, and how you change uh, the terminology. Geographical expression, is it Australian, is it Banch, is it German? Often you start to switch the terminology again. Uh, if it's a specific variety, certainly with specific varieties, uh, the more you know, you, you come to realize that certain words are typically used for uh, a Shiraz or a Tempranillo or a Viura, and almost automatically you switch to that. Uh, this is good and bad, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, uh, you would change terminology based, uh, if you're having it at home, and you're having some people over, it depends on who came over, what kind of terms you would use. If it's friends that are not particularly interested in wine, then you tone it down. Uh, if it's a real aficionado, then, then you tone it up. Uh, more expressive, more detailed. If it's a snob, well then, then that depends on uh, whether you want to depress them or, or uh, <laughs> whatever yeah, you would choose. If the business types, well, probably you're going to tone uh, your fancy language down because you might turn them off and you lose your business. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the situational is really going to change how you describe it. It's the same object. Nothing has changed about the object, but the terms, again, you change. And uh, then if you have people over who really do love wine, and you'll describe it in terms of an art object. So uh, 
the language is so variable and so adaptable to what you wanted to express. Because that's really what it's there for, is to express your feelings, your emotions, and, and how you're responding. Okay, uh, now getting to specific application to wine. Well, uh, if you're going to analyze a wine, normally you'll look at uh, its appearance, and we don't really use a heck of a lot when describing its appearance. Uh, certainly we use color, but uh, we don't really have a large number of specific terms that apply to color. Uh, you have a few, and then, and then you make some adjectives, and you say it's intense, or light, or dark, or whatever. And that, that's about it. Uh, but the terms we use for color are more or less hardwired in our brain. Uh, uh, everybody basically sees, unless you're colorblind, uh, the same range. And uh, there is some slight indication that maybe uh, certain cultural groups do perceive color slightly different, differently by the terms they seem to use. But on the whole, I guess we can basically say uh, color is hardwired. Uh, the terms we use for clarity are usurped from other uh, aspects of light. Cloudy, well, there are no clouds in it. But now that's the term we use, uh, fuzzy, and you know, well, whatever you want to use, uh, we have usurped those from other aspects of our life and applied it to wine. Uh, as far as effervescence is concerned, then certainly, indeed, those are unique terms applied to wine. Uh, I suppose you could say that... that uh, that Coke has nice effervescence, uh, but normally you wouldn't use that. Uh, and uh, we have that nice term, moose. So these are uniquely created terms, uh, largely for sparkling wines. Then we look at taste. Okay, uh, here we have some really hardwired terms that essentially all humans respond uh, pretty much the same way. Sweet, sour, savory, salt, bitter, and probably fatty acids. Uh, sweet, we pretty know it's hardwired uh, because of its uh, genetically and physiologically it's associated with certain types of receptors, proteins, and also the response that people get is essentially the same. Irregardless of culture, Irregardless of age, people have uh, taken uh, sweet substances and put it on the baby's tongue uh, just shortly after they're born, and you, you get a, uh, a pleasant response. You can just the emotional reaction of the face is positive. If you put some uh, something that's just sitting on their tongue, that, that, then you get automatically the response that you get in an adult if you did the same thing. So this obviously indicates that this is hardwired. Uh, and so we have these unique terms that apply to these. Uh, when we come to mouthfeel, uh, pretty much the same thing, hardwired. Uh, the response to people to heat, cold, prickling, texture, pain, burning, uh, the multiplicities of astringency, Again, pretty well hardwired. Uh, almost everybody will respond uh, in the emotive body language exactly the same. Unless they don't perceive it, okay, in which case they won't. And then we come to the olfactory terms. Uh, what really becomes particularly interesting with wine is what it smells like. And we have two aspects. Uh, one uh, which is in the nose, but not in the olfactory regions, the trigeminal nerves. And here we do have, again, uh, specific terms that do not relate contextually to the object. 
So we say it's pungent. Now that doesn't mean any particular thing is pungent. Pungent is an entity, it's a concept in its own right. Uh, putrid smell, that is a concept unto itself. Many things can be smell putrid, but putrid is this hardwired thing. Acrid is another uh, term. When we come to olfactory, we don't have essentially any terms that are uniquely aromatic. Everything is contextual based. And so the, these are always usurped terms. Smells like apple, smells like peach, smells like this, like that, like something else. And this is, this is definitely not hardwired. This is all based on our experience that we learn to associate certain odors with certain objects, places, times, whatever. So olfactory sensations. Now, now the molecular nature, okay, has to be volatile. Okay, clear enough. Have to get into the nose uh, by itself. Uh, more or less fat soluble because it has to pass through the mucus and uh, attach to the surface of the membrane. There's certainly thousands of them uh, that we can respond to. And, but most natural objects are a mix of compounds. Only a few instances, uh, maybe chlorine or uh, hydrogen sulfide, things of that sort, uh, where we have a unique compound that has a distinctive response. But most objects are really a mix of aromatics. And certainly wine is uh, a mix of aromatics. So if we're going to respond to this, uh, certainly it has to attach and pass through the mucus lining, or the mucus covering. And uh, depending how thick that covering is, depends to a degree how sensitive the person is to that aromatic. So if you have a cold and you're producing loss of mucus in the nasal passages, then your ability to smell goes way down. Uh, my wife uh, had so grand that she had almost no mucus, and of course her sensitivity was very high. So essentially anything that went into her nose, certainly she would respond to. Uh, for each receptor in the olfactory passages in the nose, uh, we have a, a single, oh, I forgot my genetics, oh yes, yes. Uh, how inappropriate, not following my uh, plan. Okay, uh, generally we have approximately 340 genes uh, that are produced, that produce a individual receptor. And uh, these respond to one or more compounds. Uh, and uh, so each receptor in the olfactory passages produces only one of these receptor uh, proteins. So one gene, one receptor. Uh, each receptor protein, however, is not, does not necessarily respond to a single aromatic compound. It's almost like the fingers, it has a number of digits, and these proteins have a number of receptor sites. So a particular receptor protein may respond to more than one compound. And uh, so that means that uh, it is possible that two different receptors will respond to the same compound, and usually that is definitely the case. You have a series of receptors respond to a single compound. Um, so uh, the responses may vary. And one receptor may respond to lower concentrations of the compound, others to higher concentrations of the compound. So there's a lot of flexibility in the potential response to any particular aromatic compound. Uh, the receptors for individual uh, 
receptor proteins is spatially positioned along the olfactory passages. So it's kind of a strip, and you have different receptors in different positions, almost like keys on a keyboard. So we have the piano, and you have the ones that respond to low notes down here, and the ones that respond to the high notes up here, and so on. And uh, that becomes particularly interesting when one realizes that there is a spatial pattern of receptors across the olfactory passages that this partially explains, uh, well, there, there are other aspects, but partially explains why uh, orthonasal through the nose response to the same uh, substance is different than retronasal. And uh, well, just Limburger cheese. If you give somebody Limburger cheese and they don't know it, uh, oh, take that stuff. Uh, stinks it, putrid, ugh, uh, awful. Uh, no one would eat that stuff. But if you hold your nose, put it in your mouth, then you can open your nose, uh, it actually tastes dang, dang good. And so here's exactly the same aromatics. It's one is going in uh, through the nasal passages, it's coming back. And so it's almost like uh, if we use the piano keyboard analogy, you're playing uh, a series of notes, but you're playing them high to low, and the other you're playing low to high. And so if you do that, certainly it will sound different. It won't recognize the same thing. And this gets us to how do we actually learn and recognize odors. So here we get to the cerebral interpretation. Okay, and that is, starts to become particularly interesting. Uh, the responses go from the nasal passages up to olfactory receptors in the base of the skull. Uh, and uh, they go from there originally to the amygdala. In the, uh, it, it's largely considered to be the emotional center of the brain. And so this is the strong emotional content we generally have to aromas. Because uh, almost the first place it goes to is to the emotional center. Uh, Subtly it goes up uh, to a whole series of areas in the higher centers of the brain and is interpreted. Ah, good word, interpreted. Uh, the memory that develops uh, is context-based or kind of it's, it's gestalt. Ooh, lovely word, that one. Uh, and uh, after it has interpreted things, then finally it tries to connect uh, to the part of the brain which is associated with words. So uh, these impulses are going through a whole series of areas, being interpreted, and then sent for analysis and see if there is a word that can be stuck to this memory pattern. And uh, this slide is just an example of the variation that we have amongst people. Now this is to uh, TCA, that wonderful aromatic, and uh, that gives us nice corky wines. Uh, so the range of uh, this is the threshold uh, level that various people respond to TCA. And it's huge, humongous. So if, if I'm here and I detect even the smallest amount, yuck, this wine is uh, unacceptable. The person down there says, well, what's wrong with it? Wonderful. He doesn't perceive it, so it is not suppressing the, his response to the other positive aspects of the wine. If I respond to it, to me, it's the dominant thing. It masks everything. Uh, I don't see anything else anymore. I just see it has this awful TCA smell, this quirky aspect, and I reject it. These other people fine, just fine, no problem. And so uh, it's, uh, and uh, okay, this one, 
uh, mighty complicated, but shows that uh, the interpretation part of sensation. Uh, we have touch aspects from various parts of the tongue. They are progressing their way up to this area, which is the orbital frontal cortex, basically right here, uh, which does the interpretation. So it gets responses from touch, olfaction, taste, and vision. And these are all coalescing, combining together, forming this context, this gestalt, this ideotype uh, that one tends, if it's emotionally intense, or you uh, get exposed to it sufficiently often, develops an odor memory. And uh, it goes off to all sorts of areas, and also there is some indication that based on uh, the interpretation of the sensations you get in the wine or anything else, uh, if some of these sensations do not fit the pattern you have developed, and you say, uh, the brain interprets this, something's wrong with the image, the messages I am getting from my sensory uh, sight. You're wrong. And therefore, it actually may be sending messages back to the area that it thinks is sending false information to suppress those sensations. It's kind of intriguing. Uh, and the, this is, uh, there's also apparently a hierarchy in the brain as to what is the most important sense in, in these idea types that we create. And it seems the vision is number one. Uh, vision has power over olfaction, olfaction has power over taste and taste has power over touch. So there's almost kind of a hierarchy of what is the most important sense. And so we have the classic examples, uh, well, well, uh, we'll go to that in a moment. And, okay, well, am I there? Oh, well, anyway, memory pattern, okay. Um, factors that influence how we develop this memory pattern, this ideotype. Uh, certainly the strength of the uh, response that we get. If it's really a strong emotional impact, uh, oh, okay, if you, you smell uh, hydrogen sulfide gas, that is kind of a strong emotional response. Uh, so you remember this very quickly. You don't have to have many exposures to this. You don't have to have many exposures to skunk uh, to uh, learn what it is like. If it's less emotional, okay, you need more uh, repeats to, to uh, fix that memory. So we have emotional impact, the repetition, and if you are consciously attempting to look and search. So, so if you're a taster and you're serious, certainly you are concentrating on that wine and you're focusing your attention and certainly that will aid the development of the memory. The potency of uh, this aromatic uh, response. Well, if it's strong, it's very aromatic. Uh, if it's sufficiently strong, it will waft all over the room and uh, or wherever you are. And so in those situations, Generally, uh, you don't need the context so much to remember the name. So if you're walking outside and, and you say, oh boy, somebody's having a nice steak and uh, uh, barbecuing that, oh gee, they're going to invite me over. Uh, <laughs> but you don't have to see the barbecue. You don't see the smoke. You don't see anything else. You just barbecue uh, or... Uh, somebody frying bacon, or oh boy, is the toast ready? Uh, you don't have to see. The, but for most things, the intensity of 
the aromatics are relatively weak and so there basically you have to see the object to really clue in uh, and it's much more difficult to actually associate the name with the experience, this concept, uh, this object, uh, without seeing it. And uh, as psychophysiologists, they've done all sorts of tests of giving people samples, a colorless sample of so and so. And uh, what's it smell like? Haven't a clue, uh, other than I really, it's kind of familiar, but uh, I can't put a name on it. Uh, well, lost big examples of that. And uh, so these, uh, that term is really tied up with the object, the experience. And uh, so the weaker the aromatic, the stronger the association with the context in which you experience that aroma. But it does, uh, this holistic way in which we use terms for odors of wines does lead to good bias, potential. And certainly color is uh, probably the most famous one. And of course then we have aromatics. Uh, you, you smell a nice white wine and many people say, gee, was the, the, the wine sweet? Of course it's bone dry. But they think it's sweet. Why do they think it's sweet? Because very quickly, and again, they've done the experience with uh, an aromatic compound that people have never smelled before. And they give them the aroma and they give them a sample and it tastes sweet. Uh, within one or two tries, the brain has already bonded those two together. And so when you smell that aroma, you also, the brain says, sweet. Whether the tongue is sending in any impulses or not, doesn't make any difference. Uh, so, and here's this classic example that was done in Bordeaux, probably many of you have seen this before. Uh, uh, it was uh, a bunch of university students in Bordeaux and they are becoming winemakers and they're doing sensory evaluation and learning language. So they're, they're coming to the lab and sampling all these wines, and describing them in appropriate terms. And uh, so they have a, a series of wines and uh, there's uh, the white wine and uh, the, the terms they use tend to be appropriate for white or red wines. So, so if, if you have a red wine, you talk about uh, red colored objects or dark colored objects, uh, cherries and raspberries and blueberries and so on. Uh, if it's a white wine, you, usually it's pale colored, uh, yellow, orange kind of objects, uh, peaches, apples, uh, apricots and so on. So uh, here we have uh, for the white wine, uh, what kind of terms do they use? Ones that are appropriate for white? Uh, do they use many that are appropriate for red? No. Uh, they give them a real red wine? Uh, okay. Uh, what do they use? Dark colored terms? Do they use many uh, that, that you would kind of think relative to white? Not many. Uh, so they, they give them uh, another set of wines. Uh, one's white, one's red, and uh, so they do the same thing again, of course, uh, with white, of course they use the appropriate terms, then they're good students, they learn, they know what to do, and <laughs> so they, they use the white terms for the white wine, and the, the red wine, of course, they give them the appropriate red terms, uh, the only thing is, the student didn't know it was exactly the same wine, exactly the same wine, except it was colored red. One that was colored red. Uh, with anthocyanins, and they did other tests, they found that the anthocyanin has no aroma, no taste, so it wasn't affecting any aspect of the wine, it's just expectation. Is that red? 
I use red wine turns. Of course, hey, I'm not going to use white wine turns for a red wine. Ah, I'm a good student. Hey, I want to pass. <laughs> And uh, here's another example of the influence uh, of uh, color perception. Uh, this is analysis of the wines based with NMR, uh, giving an indication, uh, an objective measure of the color intensity of the wine and the use of the scores that people gave to the wine as far as its quality. And uh, most people learn that the darker color of the wine, usually the more flavor it is, and of course, the more flavor, you think uh, higher quality, so you rate it higher. So here we are, reading of people uh, was that they were actually assessing the quality of the wine by the color of the wine. And uh, again, people have done a whole range of experiments uh, where people uh, taste the wine with the color, without the color, and certainly the rating is markedly different. So we are really influenced by what we see, and that therefore, depending on the type of tasting, uh, one should not see the color. Uh, but uh, it's not always you're not supposed to see the color. Uh, if if you're having it at home, well, sure, sure you want. They use all the psychological uh, ploys possible to make people like the wine. <laughs> uh, now, now, if you want to study the wine per se, then you don't want any of these influences. And uh, so, so, really what you do depends on what you want to get out of the tasting. And uh, hey, here's, uh, how many people know what this is right away? I guess you haven't seen this very often. Uh, anybody know what it is? <laughs> yes, uh, it's the Dalmatian. So here's our dog. There's the head. There's the top, the leg. And well, once you have uh, initially, all you see is dots. Once you see the dog, then you will always see the dog. It's just instantaneous. You have learned a pattern. You know what a dog looks like. You have a, uh, this is almost a platonic, uh, you, you know what dogness is. <laughs> so we have an image in our brain of dogness. And so once you see, you fill in the rest. Uh, just a neat, neat picture of that one. Uh, this is actually a photograph that was uh, taken and made uh, with high contrast. And uh, uh, there, there's another fun one. Uh, and of course, uh, you see two people here. Uh, one, the old lady, and the other, the very young girl. And the old lady, Here's the nose and the mouth, and uh, the young pretty girl, and there's her nose and the face and the hair and the mouth, so on. But as all these icons or images that we create in our mind, we see only one at a time. You can't see the old woman and the young girl at the same time. You can see either one or other, but both are there. And it's just amazing what our mind does. We can see one or other. We can't see both at the same time. It's just uh, fascinating. And Ron, does it matter which we see first? No. If there's not a typical, if people see No, well, the, some people will initially see the old woman. Other people will initially see uh, the, the young girl, but... But that's not a reflection of your age. Like uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't know if anybody has studied that. That would be kind of interesting if uh, there were an age-related aspect to what you saw first in this image. Uh, 
Another one that also shows uh, situational uh, aspects of what we perceive, and it's still the same thing. If we go across this way, it's obviously that's B. Can't read it. That's B. That's obvious. But if you read down this way, well, clearly it's 13. Same thing. Uh, just uh, context and situation really. Uh, the brain is perceiving and interpreting, and it interprets what we see, smell, taste in context based on its situation and based on our past experience. And so uh, when you sample wine, you're really basing it on a context. It's not isolated. It fits in with all our past experience and we see it in that light. And uh, this is one of the real take home things is that what you see may not be what's there. And uh, the more professional you are, the more you have to doubt your, uh, what your mind is telling you. And uh, you come back and say, well, am I really perceiving that? Or is it just my mind fooling me? Uh, I've learned a pattern, and it's twisting what I'm seeing to fit the pattern. And uh, certainly that's what it's doing with this. Uh, we fill in the gaps to make it deep, and we leave the gaps out when we see a 13, yes? Um, sorry to To the majority of people, yes. It, it's disappointing, but uh, <laughs> it really, uh, it's amazing how much you can fool people. Uh, there, there's a, a good example, uh, another one of the, these uh, perception psychologists do a lot of fun experiments. Uh, they did one, they took an orange flavored drink. Okay. No. Everybody here, uh, they give them orange flavored drink. Yeah, yeah, that's orange. Well, <laughs> I have that every morning. Hey, uh, you can't fool me on that. Oh, yes, you can. Uh, for many people, if you give them an orange flavored drink and you color it dark red, they'll say cherry. <laughs> How can they make that mistake? They, we think. Uh, orange is so distinct, just because you color it red, you're not going to mistake orange for cherry. But many people do. And uh, so, uh, uh, this world we live in is uh, fascinating. <laughs> okay, inherent problems, because uh, what we perceive is basically context based. Uh, we have the, this classic thing that uh, uh, called uh, the tip of the nose phenomenon, uh, which is uh, certainly very common. Uh, well, where you smell something, and boy, that's familiar. And, uh, would that name come to me? No, it will not. And uh, so they, they, they just took the, uh, the tip of the tongue uh, relative to words and uh, said tip of the nose phenomenon, uh, which is really neat. And then we have uh, this idiosyncratic usage of terms. Uh, okay, it's contextual base because it is contextual base uh, based on your personal experience of life. Uh, will depend on what terms you use for this uh, particular uh, pattern of aromas. Uh, where do we this develop? Well, we have uh, cultural upbringing. Uh, cer certainly, based on your cultural upbringing, you will have certain aromatic experiences that another cultural 
uh, background would not provide you. Uh, so if uh, I sample this wine and I say, oh, hold on, I detect durian in there. Uh, how many people know what durian smells like? Ah, yeah, it is very distinctive. And once you've tried it, you do not forget. I, I like it, but, uh, well, I like the taste uh, of durian, but the aroma, not so great. It's just, just something like Limburger cheese. Uh, once you get it in the mouth, it tastes really good, but uh, just hold your nose before you get it in. Um, and so uh, this cultural background, uh, well, my cultural background is I taught economic botany, and of course, you're doing every kind of weird thing you can possibly find to your students. And so, so I got a lot more experiences than normal. Uh, so, but cultural outbring is a certainly important thing in how we get this idiosyncratic usage of terms that you'd find if you just took people off the street. Uh, certainly geographical uh, experience. Uh, if I was living in Southern France or in Northern Italy, uh, I would probably have truffles on occasion. And so I would see or perceive I see truffles in wine. If I've never had a truffle before, obviously I'm not going to use that term. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, geographical influences, for example, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, often uh, people who are English background uh, will say they detect uh, in a really good Cabernet uh, some uh, black currant, uh, a common descriptive term. Uh, but if you're from France, normally they don't use that. It's equivalent. They talk about it has violet. I, I can't argue with that uh, because uh, I'm not really familiar with that. Uh, but black currant seems to fit for me. Often they're using this term violet. Uh, then even the language that a the inner workings of language, uh, which is basic on culture and how we perceive things. Uh, uh, according to one person who studies linguistics, he considers that based on uh, Germanic type languages and Latin type languages, the Romance languages, they are, we use different terms for the same thing. Uh, the Germanic English kind of Anglo-Saxon kind of terminology, tends to be more straight. It's in the straight between the eyes. French and other Romance languages tend to be more inflective, sort of twisting around. So, so we have, in English, we, we say, we taste the wine. Uh, in French, we say, sentir de vin. Uh, sour, in English, pow. Uh, in French, it's bare, green. Well, that, that is a much more indirect term, a kind, kind of softer term. Uh, sweet in English, do in French. Soft, oh yes. And uh, well, well, in English we say connoisseurs. Good stuff. In French, uh, amateur de vin. My, much more inflective. Uh, and uh, French, uh, because it is this inflective language, tend to take more words to say the same thing. Uh, my wife said, she was, you could say uh, uh, what I say in a lot fewer words. And of course, you look at the translation English, French. French is long, English much shorter. Okay. Uh, what are terminology in a tasting, per se? Um, we have terms that respond to uh, factors that are temporal in development. Uh, where we have the term development, which is how the aromatic aspects of the wine changes over time. The, the, the dynamics of the... Uh, often we talk about the wine opening. So, so it's 
kind of closed in the beginning and then its aroma, uh, aroma develops and expands and changes with time. Uh, an interesting phenomenon, which is really dynamics of the release of aromatics from the wine, from its various uh, fixed and semi-fixed states in the wine itself. And then how long does it last uh, before the wine becomes just Venus or uh, it dies or fades away or whatever. So we have a couple of terms that really refer to this temporal development of the fragrance and then we can talk about its intensity, uh, various scale of intensity and then we have this third aspect uh, almost of a triangle uh, which is this uh, qualitative aspect uh, how do we describe it and there generally we have two types of terminologies uh, one which is much more common uh, and almost ex the, the only type that's used by con uh, sort of consumers uh, are the holistic kind of terms uh, so, so we have uh, this range of things, uh, various idea types. Of course, they can vary depending on the style. So we'll use a particular set of terms that fit a particular style, fit a particular variety, uh, fit a particular geographic uh, expression of a particular wine style. Then we have more general terms, uh, again, holistic, balance and harmony. Uh, this is uh, all these senses coming together. Uh, we can, or so some people tend to use terms which indicate a kind of weight, uh, heavy, light, watery, so on, uh, power, robust, weak, lively, and so on, uh, size and shape. Uh, here we're getting more poetic as we go down and now we're getting into big and round. Well, what's a round wine? Not like a ball. <laughs> In essence, it makes no sense, but most people have a kind of a feeling what round means. It is kind of complex, I suppose. That that's what they mean by that term. And we get progressively metamorphic. It's heavenly, it's seraphic. Oh, my. And it just... Uh, the heavens have opened. Oh, yes. Uh, the existential experience going on here. Uh, and then we have uh, these anthropomorphic, we're getting even further away from reality. Uh, this wine is feminine, <laughs> feminine wine. Ludicrous term. Uh, but most people have meanings it's not too aggressive. <laughs> and uh, a fat wine, fat wine? That doesn't make any sense, but people use this. It's an aggressive wine. Well, okay, presumably what they mean is astringent, but if you don't know the word astringent, I guess aggressive is as, as good as uh, you're going to find. Uh, then we come to more descriptive terms. Here we're getting more into real uh, analysis of wine. Uh, we want to use something a little more precise uh, than these sorts of things. Uh, so we can still have gen generic kind of terms. Uh, most people have a feeling for what a uh, spicy smell is. It really is a whole host of things, but we lump it together as spice, uh, fruity kind of smells, smoky kind of smell, jammy kind of smell, and then we come uh, even more precise where we try and specify what kind of uh, fruitiness or floral, uh, iris, rose, peach, apple, cherry. But even there, uh, with all of these, these are still pretty nebulous. Uh, if you're an iris lover, uh, then you know that different irises certainly smell very differently. And you, you can almost recognize this variety and this uh, cultivar, oh yeah, yeah, that, that that's, uh, smells of this variety and smells of so on. Uh, certainly roses have a kind of rosiness to them, but different roses have, also have different smells. Different apple varieties have different smells. 
So uh, we can get increasingly specific or at least attempt to do so. Uh, language training, uh, sample preparation, uh, all sorts of problems here. Uh, normally we take the object itself, uh, you can grind up apples or something, or you can get aromatics that kind of resemble apples. Uh, so depending on what you want to do, but when you prepare these samples, the problem is how do you keep them consistent over time? There's all sorts of problems with that, various solutions. Probably the nicest solution that exists, but I don't know if it's even commercially available, are the scratch and sniff forms. Where we want to know what peach is like, well you take your sample, scratch it, oh yeah that peach, throw it away, the next time you scratch another one, so you don't have this problem of oxidation and so on. Uh, but sample preparation is normally uh, a basis for uh, the training uh, purposes. We have panel selection. Uh, we're using people's almost uh, bioanalytic instruments. Uh, and uh, so train them in descriptive views uh, to avoid uh, idiosyncrasy as much as conceivably possible so that everybody responds pretty much the same way. And if you don't respond the same way, well then, then you're off the panel. <laughs> uh, if you're not going to play, uh, if you can't respond properly, then off the panel you go. Because we are using you kind of as this instrument. And, uh, and of course, you get rid of all this variation, reduce it down, so that your statistics, uh, you can use statistics more appropriately. If it's also, if it's not on a standard curve, if your population is not a standard curve, how can you use the appropriate statistics? Now, enology students, uh, okay, uh, you want to know what faults are like so you can recognize them quickly and hopefully make appropriate changes uh, quickly. You want to know what various varieties and styles and geographic aspects are like. And certainly if you're communicating with your uh, winery staff, uh, you want to be able to communicate clearly so that the terms you use, they understand, and that, so everybody is talking on the same plane. Uh, wine appreciation courses, uh, there it's to try and get students to think in their mind, think of what you are smelling. Most consumers do not. I know this from experience many, many times. Uh, they basically consumers perceive wine by taste. Uh, they, do, the glasses they use are abominable. Uh, <laughs> do they swirl them and sniff them and uh, no. <laughs> just, just down the tube? And, uh, how can you sense the aromatics of a wine if you drink it that way? Well. Uh, they're not trained in that regard and that's one of the prime functions of wine appreciation is to try and get them to focus on the really fine subtleties of wine uh, so they can recognize. The, the caveat with all this training though that you change people because you're learning and suddenly now you recognize things you didn't recognize before. You are a changed person. You're not the same as you were before. So the process of training people actually changes the person. Well, uh, in certainly training a panel, you want that. And uh, so it really depends on how much training you use, depends on uh, what you want uh, in this process. So here's an example of uh, well, what often one would do in, uh, with a panel. Uh, you want to uh, study this wine and see what some procedure has done relative to the aromatics of the wine. And so you present this and say, oh, well, well obviously the sweetness went down, the fruitiness went down, uh, the effervescence went up or down or whatever. Uh, and so you can compare the wine based with the panel results. You can compare the effect of some property 
So some change in how you grew the grape, how you fermented it, whether you did a different yeast, you fermented it at a different temperature, you want to see the real effects, that this is one way. But uh, when you hand this to somebody and say, uh, is that a Cabernet? Well, uh, you'd say probably no, because well, we've got effervescence there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, when you look at that uh, spider diagram, can you recognize the wine? Ah. The, this is not for identification. This has a specific purpose. It is not really des describing part of the wine, but it's not the holistic aspect of the wine. The same way is a floral diagram. Now, if I were a better botanist, and I really knew my plants, I suppose I could look at this and then... Mm, yeah, that's an in a far ECE there. Uh, but uh, at my level of expertise in botanical identification, I can recognize that version of an in a far uh, water lily, but not this one. Uh, but it is a representation of it. Certain essence of that water lily is described by this. The same as that wine. Part of it is idealized and represented by that. So what we are creating is not reality, it's an aspect of reality for a specific purpose. A very useful purpose, but certainly, again, not full reality. So influence of expectation, well, I've already uh, basically talked about this before, um, but the instructions you get in a tasting. Say uh, uh, you're in a tasting, and I say, well, um, I think we ought to look for some faults here. If I had done the same tasting before, without mentioning faults, very, uh, the number of faults recognizes, recognized would be way down. As soon as I tell people, look for faults, you're going to see them whether they're there or not. And uh, so, uh, again, the focus, the intent, the instructions, if you tell people, um, well, would you assess these Pinot Noir and Noirs for me? Well, if you know what Pinot Noir uh, is like, since you expect, and I've said, well, uh, sample these Pinot Noirs, automatically, in your mind, you have the idea type of Pinot Noir. And so you, you're almost going to fit that onto the wines, whether they're Pinot Noir or not. You're going to look for Pinot Noir in those wines, even if they're not. So again, um, where we are a very malleable uh, entity, and the direction will change the terms and we... Uh, one often has to be very careful with the terms one use. Uh, an environmental distortion, color of the wine, uh, a classic example also done in Bordeaux by the same person who did the one uh, with the color of wine. Uh, students came in, uh, they were going to have a tasting, and by accident, by intent, uh, there, the bottle was off in the corner. And, of course, these are students in Bordeaux. They, they you know, uh, the Grand Cru Class A and the, the Plonk uh, Bordeaux. Uh, the wine, uh, there was a, maybe Chateau Lafitte or Chateau Latour or uh, well, the Grand Cru Class A. So, so you just see all the stuff. Chateau Latour. Oh, well, uh, how am I going to describe this wine? the number of positive <laughs> responses for this wine was very high. And then uh, a week or so later, students come in, they have another tasting, and uh, maybe they have Ponte Cadet uh, there. And, oh, wow. <laughs> I had a run the mill Bordeaux. And how many negative comments? Much higher. Number of positive content, uh, comments down. Exactly the same way. Again, uh, the influence of context. Uh, they thought it was 
high class wine, used appropriate terms, thought it was low grade wine, appropriate terms. Therefore, keeping uh, the knowledge in, of course, uh, comments of authorities, you go to a tasting, uh, Antonori is there and he's talking about how fine his wines are, and of course everything, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, tell me more, uh, kind of thing. And uh, that, that, that's just the nature of us, and we have to be careful about that. Effectiveness in wine description. Uh, in reality, we have to honestly say it's not that great. Uh, people have done, again, tests, asking people, giving them a series of wines, different wines, uh, tell them, write down in descriptions for yourself how, uh, to recognize this wine when I give it to you again. So they write down the descriptions. The wines go away, uh, same wines come back, different order, uh, you don't know what they are, and they ask the people, use your descriptions that you just made for those wines to identify. The success rate is sadly very, very poor. And that's just shortly after having sampled the wines. You still have the memory. And so these terms are, are useful for us. They express something to us, but their ability to really recognize wines is not what we would like. Uh, and for neophytes, <laughs> there's almost no correlation. Um, and uh, Kane, uh, uh, he was talking about odor recognition. Well, what do we really need to do it? Uh, the more common it is, the better. Uh, prolonged experience, certainly. Supplemental clues, absolutely. Uh, how can, but can we still use this? Yes, even though it seems pretty negative. Uh, it still can be used to identify uh, something. If we have the idea type, uh, we can use either deductive or inductive reasoning. Uh, you can say, well, if I don't recognize it immediately, I can say, well, what could it be? Cabernet, no, not Cabernet. Pinot Noir, no, definitely not Pinot Noir. Tempranillo, no, 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 no. Sangiovese, no, no. Tempranillo, maybe. And uh, so you go through uh, just eliminating, uh, if you don't get it from positive, then you can always use it from negative. And the idea type, it's probably the, the most important thing that you create in your mind. That, that it may not be something you can easily tell somebody else about, but it's useful to you. And that, that's the real advantage of the idea type. And so in an ideal world, well, what would we like? Uh, or what I would like. <laughs> uh, if the descriptors that we used to apply to wine uh, actually seem to be there. Oh, well, I've actually jumped down to here. Uh, Leachy nuts and Gewürztraminer. Or we can either say Gewürztraminer has Leachy nut, or I can say Leachy nut smells like Gewürztraminer. Either one, so depending on how you want to run it. Bell pepper and Cabernet, black pepper and Shiraz, vanilla and oak, kind of exchangeable. Uh, and for most people, uh, what I think the uh, should concentrate on is not using fancy descriptors, because uh, they often tend to be illusionary, uh, is to concentrate on something that is practical for them. And for everybody it's practical. Uh, if you try and focus on the variety, what is to me, I develop a memory for the basic platonic concept of a Cabernet, of a Pinot Noir, a Chardonnay, a Viura, uh, a Riesling, a Versamine, whatever it is, you focus on that. Stylistic differences, very useful, practical. Um, provenance, if you can detect these things, and for certain ones you can. Uh, certainly age-related, very useful. Uh, if you're willing to 
the age of wines. Uh, dynamic changes, very interesting. Uh, and of course, there's the poetic license aspect. Certainly it's fun. Oh yeah, it's a nice game. Uh, you can have all sorts of fun with it, as long as you're not too serious. Uh, if you really start to believe too much of this stuff, well, uh, then it, and kind of impose this on people, uh, that certainly is inappropriate. So take home, uh, I've, uh, for the consumer, really it's concentrate on recognizing certain types. Helps you when you go out and buy. Uh, and uh, in essence, it's something like Robert Louis Stevenson when he talked about travel. For my part, I travel not to go anywhere, uh, but to go. Is the going that the fun part? It's not the getting there. It's the going is the fun part. I hope that's true. I'm going on a trip, <laughs> so I hope that the, the getting there will be the fun part. And uh, for the professional, is really being aware of various biasing factors, so you can try and eliminate them, because the professional really wants to know the truth. That they want to allow things to lie to them, or your brain to lie to you, and uh, doubt your perceptions, uh, question their validity, and remember perceived reality is not necessarily reality, and that reality from different people is not the same. So what I perceive in the wine is not necessarily what anybody else perceives. And just one final thing, caveat, uh, there's a recent study out of Alberta indicating that when you describe, uh, to say, a meal, and uh, trying to describe how, why, how wonderful a meal is, your perception, your emotional response to it actually goes down. <laughs> so, in a sense, uh, the, the more you describe these uh, responses to emotional things and try to explain why, it was so emotional, apparently your appreciation goes down. So some way, maybe for the consumer, uh, it's better that they not try and explain why they like it or explain it in poetic language because the more precise they become, they may actually like it less. So, uh, not exactly what one would like to know, but surprisingly, uh, if you uh, describe objects uh, like the Mercedes Benz that you bought, uh, and you describe uh, all the features of that Mercedes Benz, your appreciation of what you purchased actually goes up, doesn't go down. The uh, strange uh, result from this study, I don't know, uh, has to be repeated, but uh, it certainly was a fascinating paper to read. And uh, so that's it. Uh, if you uh, if your uh, bottom is not too sore, <laughs> do you still have any questions? So certainly I'm willing to answer it. Okay, well, no, normally in a good tasting, uh, we, we will have it such that, like in the tasting lab, you don't see anybody else. So you can't see any body language aspects. So you can't be biased by that. People don't say anything to anybody else. So you can't get the verbal uh, biasing. Uh, if it's you really want to study red, well then it's fine to show the color. But if you're having different wines uh, from different ages or different varieties together, then probably it's better to kind of hide the color because uh, we have this aspect of color intensity. If you have a dark colored red wine and a light colored red, almost assuredly the dark colored wine is going to get a higher mark than it would have otherwise. 
and the lighter red will get a lower mark uh, or a no lower appreciation than it would have if it had all the same color. And uh, so um, uh, the, the ease at which you can describe things uh, certainly facilitates the tasting. Uh, for most tastings, um, the fact that you have a series of wines that you can go back and forth. Uh, I really, uh, for me when I do tasting, uh, it takes about 20 minutes. Of course, if I'm going to spend 20 minutes on a wine, I might as well have six there all at once. So, so I can sample this one, think about it, take this one, go back and forth, and see how the wine changes with time. Because I find one of the most fascinating aspects of wine is that development of its aroma. It's changing. Uh, or at least I perceive it's changing. Uh, phys physiochemically, it is indeed changing. Uh, but also, I may be changing too. Uh, because as I perceive things, uh, certain receptors are becoming adapted, and, but others have not become adapted. So what I first detect, I may not detect this other compound. Once I become adapted to this set of compounds, now I start to respond to other ones. And so so uh, certainly giving people time to assess the wines and not to be in a rush, uh, just go back and forth and uh, smell appropriately. And I'm sure all of you uh, know all about that. Yes. Extending to this question, would you recommend that we tell the tasters, or as a taster, we um, taste everything first and then start rating? Uh, start rating while we taste. Uh, uh, either way, in a way. Um, the, the, now, when you start to write, uh, I would probably recommend that people start writing right away. Uh, there are other people who say uh, the inverse. Um, because uh, no, normally when you're sampling, hey, you smell the wine at the top of the glass. So you're sensing certain types of aromatics which are more potent than others. And then, then you stick the proboscis in the, in the glass and uh, you get other ones and so on. And you swirl and the whole thing. Uh, but as you swirl and through time, different aromatics are escaping. And so the in, uh, intensity, the concentration of various aromatics are going to change over time within that glass. And it becomes interesting with this time that if you sample it right away, you're sampling maybe before the uh, aromatics start to open up very much. And of course, then you go back again, they've opened up a bit more, and you've opened up a bit more. Uh, you're perceiving different things, different aspects. And for me, that this is expanding the diversity of knowledge that you're getting from the wine. And I think that is always good. The more sensory perception you can get, and the, the way you do it, the better. Okay. Because we're, we're, we're told on one side of the point not to feed them the answers in the tasting room. Right. You know, that they're supposed to self-discovery and so on. But on the other hand, we're trying to develop those terms to reinforce in people's brains that black pepper is a really great thing in Shiraz. That's right. Are you suggesting that we give them these terms? Uh, again, it depends on the intent of the training. If you're well, going to say in a tasting bar. Uh, okay. Uh, in that situation, uh, 
if they're not really familiar with Shiraz, then I would suggest giving them terms that majority of people have come to say, well, I find these things in there. And that will help them to focus uh, their attention. Uh, so they have in the th back of their mind, pepper, hmm, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yes, you are biasing them towards that. But you're biasing them towards something that the majority of people accept is real. And in fact, in Shiraz, it is real. Because it is the same compound. So we're not cheating them at all. It's the same aromatic compound that you get in black pepper you're finding in Shiraz. So in that sense, you're legitimately helping them find something that is real. It's not an illusion that you're trying to steer them towards. It's a reality that you're trying to steer them towards. So, uh, uh, okay, in another sense, uh, if you bring people together and you say you want to develop a panel, there are various points of view as whether you should just allow people to produce the terms that they then select, uh, or uh, in another sense, if you want them, uh, again, the intent, that, that is the experimenter that presents the terms. These are the terms you're going to use. If you can't use them properly, then you're off the panel, sorry. Uh, and if you can use them properly, then you're wrong. The, the intent is really a major factor. so that you can write some more and bring back all of this information to us at another talk. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Join me in the um, now it's my job to let everybody know about tomorrow's uh, speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Stewart, um, also a Covey Fellow, and he's assistant associate, sorry, professor in biological sciences. Bioactive polyphenols from wine grapes is his talk. And then next week is our last uh, speaker, Jim Wilworth, and he's talking, giving some updates on freeze protection and cold hardiness research. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you, Ron. That was very informative, and uh, everybody have a great day.